Um, we will continue with the uh, um, discussion. I just want to make a brief announcement for the uh, uh, for our digital fellows, uh, whether physically here in the house or at uh, at uh, your own computers, you can tweet questions. Actually, um, just try to figure this out. Um, when my younger colleagues told me how to announce it, the telephone went off. I don't know how to put it on, so I'll remember. <laughs> you can tweet your questions. Uh, you just need to mention in a tweet at former West, in which F and W of former and West are capital. And uh, we'll collect the question and bring them here to the floor. Thank you very much. And Irit, the floor is yours. Uh, hello again. So the, the, we've, we've been joined by two other colleagues who have been part of this ongoing attempt to conceptualize infrastructure. You've met Stefano and you've met me. And the, the, the other colleagues are Adrian Heathfield, sitting to the extreme right. Adrian Heathfield is a writer and curator working in and around the scenes of live art experimental theater and dance, and he's professor of performance and visual culture at the University of Roehampton. And then to my right is Luis Moreno. He's an urban theorist at University College London's Urban Lab, working on the growth of financial services and their cultural effect on the forms of life of the city. And so we are um, going to try and produce some connective tissue between the sort of, of two sets of reflections that Stefano and I have pre presented. And, um, the, the, and tomorrow there will be a whole set of other considerations and then we'll try and do the same towards the end of the day again, kind of try and, and pull this together. We hope that um, you will join in with us in doing this in, 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 in whatever way. So not just questions, but um, actually in helping us produce connections which are not necessarily always obvious. Okay, thank you. Um, so a lot, a lot of this is um, not, not really about sort of juxtaposing discursive formations, saying, you know, here we think like that and there we think like that, but actually entering the discussion and trying to produce sort of, of key concepts around which one can converge in different modalities. So one of the things that I was struck by um, when, when Stefano was speaking had to do with the notion of risk and the way in which in the world of cultural practices we think of risk in a completely different way. We think of risk as the ability to put in a very active critical dimension. That's where we think risk is. That if we if we sort of, of are able, no, I, I don't mean a critical dimension in terms of exposing, unveiling, making the secret and sort of, of transparent, and not not at all, but um, with a, with a sort of recognition. The president of my university on occasion looks at me and he says, all you people produce is criticism. All you do all day is be negative. And so it's, it's not, you know, it's not in that dimension, but the, the, the sort of, of way in which sort of, of, of the production of the critical endangers the ability of something to sustain itself in a kind of business as usual mode. So I think one of the things that really interested me was how we can find a connective tissue between those notions of risk 
you know, that, that were entertaining. So that was one thing I wanted to open up in relation to your talk. The other thing that um, I'm very interested in is there is, within the world of creative practices, cultural practices, we really juxtapose between a kind of, of mani mani management infrastructure or managed infrastructure, which allows things to develop, you know, in a smooth way and in, in, in a sort of, and collectivity that operates in the absence of infrastructure. So if you don't have an operating infrastructure, you use the energies and the resources of a kind of collective spirit in order to compensate for, for that absence. And that's, that's something else that seemed to me really important to not allow for to not allow for that kind of, of, of division. So that I, I was thinking about that, and I think maybe the final um, is how to insist constantly on, on the kind of shared labor of the technical and the affective in every operation, to again not let them separate. So these sort of thinking about my concerns in relation to what you kind of put on the table, those were three things that struck me as crucial. Um, and I, I don't know if, do you want to respond to that or? <coughs> Sorry, we haven't quite figured out how to play this. No, it's okay. But we'll get that. Um, yeah, I, what I, maybe what I, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Maybe what I uh, could do is um, say something, but then also um, ask you to respond to something that came came to mind to, for me. Um, <clears throat> I mean, w one of the things that logistics is after is a uh, is is you know what Marx understood as the concrete. You know, we we have a tendency to reverse the terms abstract and concrete in our um, common language. And if somebody, you know, if somebody's saying something um, that seems uh, you know, too far removed, we say, oh, that's, that's, that's so abstract, you know, and then the, and the concrete is something that, oh, I, I get this, this is this thing, right? <clears throat> but of course, for Marx, the concrete was far more complex than the abstract. The abstract was necessary, and also for Hegel. The abstract was just a kind of necessary way of dealing with the concrete. The logistics has an, an ambition, which you can't realize, for very, mostly because it's a tool of capital, but you know, for probably because it's unrealizable, but it has a, an ambition to dwell in this concrete, to, to be able to, to imagine uh, simultaneous dimensions chance, risk, possibility, and to be able to live and move in that. And its genetic algorithms are, are, are a way of trying to express that. The, uh, the work I direct you to here, if you are uh, in any way interested in this, is, um, is the work of Luciana Parisi. Uh, Luciana has this idea that in order for the algorithm to, to descend into the concrete, it has to have its own form of abstraction. Uh, in which she locates a certain kind of resistance, by the way. It's quite a complex argument, but I, I, get, I get from her something that I feel is also the case, which is that logistics and the algorithm, they have an ambition about time and space that's, uh, that's um, an extreme drive in their work, to imagine that they could be in a situation where anything might be the next thing that happened, more than one thing might happen, it might happen in these different ways, and, and this is the way in which the people who work on algorithms are, are trying to think about them. Um, and this, um, you know, this is something that we can see at a simplistic level um, with Google, um, but you know, Google is by now a very simplistic uh, version of algorithms. It's, uh, but you know, um, the work of one of the other people from Queen Mary who's here, Matteo Pasquinelli, early on began to identify the way that algorithm was going to move away from that into more sophisticated attempts to, to be with the concrete in a certain kind of a way. So, so what I'm saying by that is that I, I'm not sure, I think the link is already there between the two forms of risk that you're talking about. Um, a kind of uh, 
that kind of daring, you know, is precisely also what what uh, what the what logistics is interested in. Um, it, the the problem for logistics is that it can't stay in that place uh, because of the problem of realization. At a certain moment, uh, money has to be made, right? So this is part of its. I, I want limits. to sort of go back to your work to an instant in your work, which for me has been incredibly important because it was sort of an instance in which pushing at a particular term, this is, uh, uh, this is something that, that um, Stefano wrote together with Fred Moten um, on debt, um, and which sort of, of made the claim that um, within a kind of commonsensical understanding of financial worlds, uh, debt was a much reviled and feared entity, whereas credit was um, a, much, a, a much desired. Um, and what they did was sort of think about credit and debt and in a way flip debt over. Because one of the things that they were arguing um, in this particular body of writing was that um, credit was extremely isolating, that um, it created a kind of atomized social um, milieu, whereas debt was actually socializing. Right, that it created a shared arena of concerns uh, in, which, in which a certain kind of sociality kind of took place. So it's that, it's that move of taking a term and pushing at it and pushing at it until it flips over and performs the opposite of the way in which it's understood commonsensically. And one of the things that I'm wondering about is how do we do that with risk, right? How do we, because the, the risk that you proposed in your discussion is a risk that entails potential loss, a great deal of potential loss to individual subjects and, and so on. And, the, the, and of course in, in avant-garde culture, risk is hugely valorized, right? It's, it's, it's the, the sort of, of always working at the edge of something uh, without a safety net and so on. And I am sort of very interested in the possibility of making those two speak to one another precisely through infrastructure. Right? So that it's not romantic in the way in which it is in creative practices, and it's not purely about the potential dangers of individual loss, um, as it is in, in financial accounts. Well, I'll say one quick thing, and I think you guys should... Uh, um, I mean, I, uh, earlier when I was talking about the, the derivative, one of the things I was trying to say is that we are now dealing with something that I would call value indifference. So value derives from its, the way in which it's placed in relations to other things, and, and endlessly so. Um, and this is, this is a, something that Fred and I talk about as the general antagonism, the, con, the kind of condition of bios is, is constant general antagonism. There's nothing negative about it to call it a general antagonism. Uh, and it is the, the condition of the concrete. <clears throat> I think that uh, when we begin to talk about debt, uh, what we're talking about is a, a, a way in which um, this kind of difference is, uh, is uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of the right word, because um, the word that keeps coming in my head is leveraged, and it would be the wrong word, but again, it's a consequence of the language that I'm co constantly dealing with. Uh, where where the, the general antagonism uh, gets turned into infrastructure through a process of debt. So where difference, the, the production of difference becomes the means for sustaining uh, social, social life. And the important thing about, uh, for me, about thinking about debt is that debt has to be asymmetrical with credit. It's not that you don't occasionally say, I, you know, I wouldn't be here without some other people doing it. It's not that credit disappears entirely, or it's not that you'd never say that you owe anybody something. But when credit and debt clear, when you're in that situation, then 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 credit becomes, a, you know, a kind of um, 
monstrous authority against the possibility of developing uh, socialized debt, a kind of debt. When you think about the debt that we understand in art, for instance, we don't think of it as something you're about to pay back, right? If you say, well, I have a debt to Charlie Parker, it's not, you're not going to pay him, right? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, we have principles of debt that are not based on that, personal principles of debt as well, right? And it's not that those, you don't speak of credit in that. So we, I, I talk about the abolition of credit, not the abolition of debt. I don't mean entire abolition, but the, but the notion that the things would be paired. And that, for me, ties up with all these issues of study and whether or not you could possibly study if you're constantly imposing this kind of credit, cred accreditation. If you, you know, you're constantly trying to leave a state of immaturity to get somewhere, this seems to me like an impossible condition for study, which is our condition in the university. You know, as I always say, if there's, there's only one thing you can't do in the university, and that's study. Right, so um, so I think that 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 the debt that you're pointing to um, is a form of infrastructure, and that it itself comes out of risk or difference or whatever you call when that gets accumulated in certain forms and people live with it rather than imagining it that it has to be cleared by credit, um, abstracted or you know uh, reduced to a, a, a something that, that that's sing, that's, uh, that's uniform rather than different, you know. Um, for me, that's where that resides. And then uh, I don't want to say too much more. So, um, so, so what I I take from that in relationship to this question of risk is that uh, you uh, one can never think of risk as a generalizable term. That it it would all be always be something that was contextual, but also singular in its occurrence in some way or another. But I'm, I'm wondering, and, and one has the sense when one experiences um, art, when one's in the effective encounter uh, with art, that these, um, that these kinds of singular risks are, are taking place all the time. Actually, risks to, um, risks to thought, risks to the uh, social fabric, risks to imagination risks to the, uh, the body of the artist as well. Um, but I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to ask you that, about that particularly, the risk to the body, the body of the artist. I mean, is there then always this, uh, some kind of sacrificial uh, dynamic uh, in, uh, in this uh, condition? I mean, it, it's to, in a sense to draw you out to the the later stuff that you were talking about in, in, in the talk, where, in, in, in a sense, our hopes rest after your long elaboration of the logics of, of, of domination and capture of the world. And you, you have this figure of the slave, right? the, of the ship, you, you would say, but of the slave. And the, the slave is a, a, a sacrificial figure in a sense, right? The slave is, is living a constantly endangered existence. Um, so I'm, and I'm wondering about that subjectivity, what that model of subjectivity, what that figure offers to the um, figure of the artist in relationship to risk. Um, I, I like the point that you, I'll come, I, I will try to address what you're saying. I like the point that you raised at the beginning though when you were talking about the impossibility of a certain kind of generalization of risk. This was the was what was put forward in the sociology of risk in the 80s and 90s that we were talking about, um, where somehow we would form a new solidarity around the fact that you know we're all experiencing climate change or something like that. That there was this thing called a generalized risk, which you, cry, in, in, you know, as you can imagine, requires incredible kinds of flattening, uh, you know, in order to get to that moment, right? Um, and there's a very nice article by Althusser called The International Decent Feelings, a very old article, where he attacks the, uh, the anti-nuclear movement, the peace movement, for the same kind of naive notion that, well, if you, get, if you flatten it all down, we're all going to get fucked by atomic bombs, so this will be a, 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 an organizing point for us. Um, and, and we can sense that in the whole notion of credit risk. Uh, so, you know, credit risk is, in fact, a, a generalizable condition and it's precisely a condition of flattening out you know different forms of difference in debt to be able to account for them collect on them and and uh, and make more money off them etc um, and of course you know we, we you know uh, uh, 
one of the weird things in the business school is that we work so much in the kind of legal economy. You know, we work in the minor economy when we talk and when we talk, you know, but the, the, the point about the subprime crisis is that, you know, once you have damaged credit, uh, anything goes, right? Anything, all the rules that are in place for, for people who supposedly have, you know, credit, good credit risk, whatever, they all go out the window, you know? And this is a huge part of the economy everywhere, you know, uh, around damaged credit. And it is always a kind of profiling that, that goes on, a generalizing that goes on in the process. Um, so, so that, uh, and, and of course that, um, that profiling, you know, uh, term leads me to say, yeah, I understand what you're saying about the, the the slave as sap sacrificial, but when I'm talking about the shipped, uh, I'm talking about um, you know a, a, a black radical tradition, which, uh, amongst other things, you know, uh, dominates the abolitionist movement despite the revisionist history, uh, wins the Civil War despite the movie Lincoln. Uh, you know, I mean, I could go on, but you know, a, a long history in which not being a subject has produced other kinds of, uh, of uh, social resistances and solidarities, et cetera. So that's sort of what, and I'm, and I'm saying to us in, in a couple of different ways that when we th put that together with West and we see that logistics in West and that way of not being a subject is at the origins of our world, that's when it becomes a resource for us if, if we need being told that, uh, which probably we shouldn't. That's when it becomes a resource for us in a certain kind of way. And of course, the shipped people are still continuing to be shipped. You know, they're still containerized. You know, so it's not as if it, that's gone away as a constant uh, 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 either. And I want I want to sort of, of intervene because I think there is the. In, and when you were talking about the figure of the slave, you were talking about a kind of capital management at the level of the body. And I would say that the way, the way in which we can intervene affectively in that discourse is by understanding the slave as an embodied criticality. Right? That this is criticality embodied because it's a, it's a condition that is lived out and it's lived out at the level of the body and therefore that body is both managed and, and captured and, and, and utilized at the same time as articulating a criticality. And that, that it's extremely important to have that duality all the time. So I know that you weren't, you weren't sort of saying this is, this is a, a, the ship need to be spoken for. But what, what I'm saying is that the figure of the slave in and of itself stands simultaneously for the sort of, of the beginnings of managed capital at the level of the human body and labor, and at the same time for a level of criticality that is that exists at, at, at it's at the body, right? Both signifies and in terms of the sort of processes of the body. And in trying to puncture this distinction between structures and affects, I, I, I think actually the figure of the slave is a very interesting figure. Uh, yeah, sorry, do you want to jump in? No, no, you finish that one. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't use the term figure of the slave, not because it's inaccurate, but because it's the view from capital of, of, um, of you know, as the ship is also, but but also because obviously African chattel slavery is the is you know is the at the heart of that particular kind of way of of trying to develop um, a social life where there is no recourse to saying I am a man or I am a woman or I am a subject, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's a generalizable condition, uh, and it occurs inside and outside Sla slavery and indenture in households uh, in all kinds of situations so so I, I'm, I that's why I'm, I'm slightly uh, I try to be slightly careful about that however I think that, that the point that you raise is right and and you know that sometimes that I will use this term logisticality to make a distinction between this history of logistics 
and a history of, of social capacities that develop within capital's management but are in excess of it and in fact call, call it, call it in its regulation into being in many cases. Capital continues to chase it, you know, dream of it, et cetera, but at the same time, it, it's, that's the resource that I see a certain kind of logisticality that's a, a, an ability that we have to be with each other that doesn't require us going through a certain kind of modern individual subject that is bound up with state and, and all kinds of things that what we know well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a, there might be a danger. I've only recently joined Free Thought, so I don't want to distance myself from the group, but I think there's a danger of maybe <laughs> talking a little bit too much about risk. Um, because I think uh, risk, as I understand it, uh, was, f as an economic notion, was formulated by Frank Knight in the 1920s. Uh, and he paired it against uncertainty. And that um, and what markets are bore is a vacuum, which is uncertainty, because you can't price the future properly. But if you can, if you can price uh, the development of a market and be, you'll be able to understand the difference between the price of a commodity now and in the future, then you can assess its risk. But what markets don't like is uncertainty. And it seems to me from a cultural point of view, um, what's interesting about art as a kind of resistance, which it seems to me where you, where you were going to at the end of your talk, Iris, when you were talking about effective surplus, and a way of thinking of effective surplus, not just as surplus value that can then be internalized in market relations and priced by your Price Waterhouse Cooper consultants who's you know, roaming the earth and going to cultural institutions and internalizing them within financial markets, but thinking more broadly about the way in which um, the problems of capitalism generate real opportunities for a counter infrastructure yeah, and and I think that's that's maybe is what is a kind of an interesting notion about uncertainty could be the grounds, or the lack of ground, or the lack of subjectivity, which is the kind of starting point for generating uh, a counter infrastructure, uh, a resistance, and a utopianism. Yeah. You know, and I think I think that there's a way in which sort of creative practices. Uh, they're tremendously useful here because they they rewrite the infrastructural impetus. So if the infrastructural impetus is for delivery, right, the, the, one of the things that creative practices can do is put a spanner in the works of that delivery. So not, not to, to sort of produce non-delivery, but to produce a set of, um, of, of slight delays, right? That are about contradictory um, dynamics kind of, of, of encountering one another. And, and I think that's where creative practices are very interesting sort of prism through which to think about infrastructure. Because the, the sort of, there are, um, there are actually sort of possibilities for non-delivery, right? So you set a whole mechanism in motion in order to actually not deliver whatever is expected, but something unexpected happens. And I think it's, it's the, the sort of relation of infrastructure to the unexpected that I'm, I'm very intrigued by, whether that's a possibility, because they are a contradiction in terms, um, in, the, in the way in which they, they sort of, of, of occupy the world. And so it's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's almost the opposite of what Stefano is doing, which I think infrastructure is a fantastically useful kind of, of prism by which to understand um, creative practices determined refusal to deliver, which is where I think they're most interesting, you know, in the absolute refusal to deliver. Uh, it's what I was sort of trying to sort of say about the, the 
I, I'm completely uninterested in any moment in which there is a given subject. So if, if, the, if we have a subject and we recognize how to kind of go about discussing it, it seems to have been delivered. That's the operation of delivering. And the, the sort of possibility of sort of, of refusing the subject, refusing the, the processes by which you, you arrive at a conclusion, that seems to me to be a set of possibilities. Because what is it? What is it to engage in thought, engage in production, engage in hope, with the ultimate aim of not delivering? Right? That this, this seems to me really very Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Um, well, let me ask you this question then. So, and this kind of crosses over these two pieces. Why is it that um, um, why is it that management theory and economic theory become so interested at a particular point? Because it's not linked necessarily to this move in finance over the last 30 years or so. There's, there's a legacy of talking about creativity within economic theory. Why does it suddenly become part of the mainstream of uh, policy making, say, in the, in the 90s? Why, why do you think there is this kind of move? Because you, you mentioned, I think, the, the word of kind of cultural infrastructure and uh, the phrase, and, and cultural infrastructure I think is something that we're all kind of familiar with, but, but why has it gained a certain kind of density in, uh, in our kind of understanding about the way in which uh, an advanced industrial society thinks about itself other than just producing the circulation of goods, people and services? Why has there been this kind of uh, connection of these two kind of concepts at this particular moment in time? That, that seemed to both of you, and, and Adrian, of course. And, all, and for you. I, I think one of you might have a more apt response to this than I. I don't think I have the answer to that question. But, uh, well, I, I, um, when the... Um, is that the one that works, or is this the one that works? No, that's yeah, that one doesn't work. Uh, when the financial crisis was starting uh, in the UK, um, Gordon Brown announced a program in which he was going to distribute uh, free theater tickets to teenagers. That was his first response to the financial theater tickets. To, uh, that was his first response to the crisis, which of course was ridiculed. Uh, but, um, but in the case of the UK, it was not so strange. In the UK, like the place I live now, Singapore is basically suffering from a kind of Dutch disease. There's so much money to be made in finance, you can't really have any other industries. You know, I mean, it's finance plus what is, you know, what supports finance, which is essentially bartenders and strippers, you know, and a few accountants, right? So that's, be that's what Singapore's like, and it's mostly what London's like increasingly. But of course, there, there was a vibrancy to London. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, in a way, the creative industries is a kind of it's a kind of grasping at at straws, you know. It's but it's also, as as far as government funding goes, it's understood as a, you know, an incredible kind of leveraging. You do you give them very little, and they do all kinds of shit, you know. I mean, that's you know, that's another. You, you have no money. Most of your other industries are dying. You know, you you give the, you give a museum a little bit of money. It's amazing how much they do. You know, you give it to a steel company, and they continue to bottom out. You know. So um, from, from a, just a cost-benefit analysis, you know, creative industries, I mean, you guys go so cheap. I mean, only university professors are cheaper than you. you know? <laughs> can, we, um, can, we invite you, can we invite you to um, put forward comments and questions and connections that you see that might be relevant? There's one to... Okay, let's just start. There's a, there's a microphone coming. Uh, oh, it's working. Yes. Um, I have a question. Um, not so much a question, but, uh, well, still a question. Uh, relating to this idea of the infrastructure 
related to an idea, I think at least as I understood it, an idea of optimization and of sustainability. It sustains something, it makes something possible, but also this idea of bringing coherence into infrastructure through creative uh, practices. And I will make here a weird leap in terms of history, this reminded me very much of the Baroque French court of Louis XIV, in which we can actually say that through the staging of power, the necessity of the staging of power, it made sure, in a very proto-fascistic way, that all elements would become <coughs> infrastructure, would become part of making power sustainable. Uh, especially the aesthetical ones, for example, in figures such as Jean-Baptiste Lully and Charles Lebrun and the setting up of the academies. And this was actually something that was copied by European courts all over Europe. Um, now, what m uh, musicologist uh, Enrico Fubini uh, declares, what, what differentiates Baroque art from Renaissance art is the position of ornament. Uh, with the importance of ornament. And ornament, he describes it as a sort of empty gesture that serves as a means of legitimation of meaning. It's sort of something that you do to make sure that the message that you're conveying becomes more powerful, whatever it is it's saying. Of course, then in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, we see a sort of rejection of ornament, perhaps related to a sort of reaction to the Hegelian dictum that ornament would be all that would be left of art when it dies. But I was wondering then if we could perhaps see the ornament in infrastructure, so these empty gestures, the sort of paratext which enables infrastructure to be so good at doing what it does, which is making possible. And I was wondering if, if the, your project has considered uh, ornament, or at least something which seems like ornament, uh, uh, as sort of like the creative practices that are always already within infrastructure as their legitimation in a way. You know, one, right. one of the things that um, we, we have to keep in mind is culturally, infrastructure works to bring together a whole set of drives that are, in terms of their own self-understanding, absolutely alien to one another. So cultural diplomacy and creative practices and um, optimization of resources and um, the, the sort of, of marketization that goes under the heading of creative industries. These are all things that are absolutely alien to one another. And one of the way, and, and this, is, this is, I think, why it sort of interested me because it's not a demand, let's say, from governance that the, the sort of creative practices pay their way. Right? It's bringing it into an infrastructure where they coexist for the sake of a certain kind of efficiency and a certain kind of optimization. And then what that does is it completely erases the alienation between the different drives. Right? So it makes them part of a singular logic. And I think that's what kind of becomes interesting because you know I live in London, so Tate Modern looms on my horizon and casts its shadow over absolutely everything. And um, the the and and you see the sort of ability to sustain everything in its opposite <laughs> through an infrastructural logic, right? It's, there, there, there is no and cannot be any coherence, but it's never argued out because what, what sort of, of, of erases the critical differences is infrastructure. So that to me is a really important part of, of, of what is going on. And there's never a demand that the arts pay their way or, or anything like that. There, there is their inscription into an overarching logic where they become part of a kind of financialization and optimization scheme where things, for example, that you would never dream of having within, let's say, artistic discourses such as nationalism and national culture become entirely permissible. So the... the I think this is one really important aspect 
of why one needs to look at infrastructure. But then the, the antidote to that is really not sort of, of exposing it. Because in a way, you know, we're all pretty well informed and pretty intelligent and we know this. Right? The, the question is, how do we conduct ourselves within these in environments? Right? How, how do we actually begin to operate as embodied criticalities? within these environments. Not by what we say against them, but how we operate within them. And, and that's you know, one of the reasons, but other people might have other perspectives. Oh, well, I, um, I have a question and a comment. Uh, I completely agree that it's a very important, infrastructure is a very important plane of contemporaneity, uh, especially for art uh, with its institutional uh, globality and without infrastructure probably it's impossible to speculate about art today. On the other hand, you spoke about empowering paradoxical elements uh, within infrastructure and my question is if this empowering and unexpected element emerges, will that be infrastructure? Or will that be something else? Because, for instance, Deleuze uh, it, doesn't use this word at all, but when he talks about the systems, he juxtaposes machine uh, and its transversality and axiomatics um, of, of the structures. So, um, uh, on the other hand, you, you were very, very... Um, correctly juxtaposing effect and structure, but the question today is not about this um, um, double, double bind uh, between uh, sensuality of effects and dryness of, of structures, but the question uh, that they are split, that the cognitive and sensitive things are split and they are irreversibly split. And uh, we have that in Agamben, we have that in, in contemporary philosophy, and the question is not in bringing effect to infrastructure, but that there is no bond. Because, um, well, personally I cannot imagine uh, how to empower infrastructure if we keep the term and if we keep its uh, I don't know, its standpoints and its uh, type of dissipation. Uh, because infrastructure is extreme externality, while affect is extreme internality. And the question is about how to find the bond between this outlying externality and eventual internality. Um, I, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying. I, I, I am, if, you might remember that in the 70s there were these d debates in science uh, between a kind of people science emerged out of movements in the 70s and what they saw as a kind of incorrect science being developed in the Soviet Union and elsewhere. <coughs> And the notion basically was somehow in a people science, everybody should be involved with the science. Everybody should be participating in it, et cetera, et cetera, <coughs> as opposed to science as a specialization. When I think about, or I should say, when I, when I started to think about what Arita had proposed for infrastructure, what I was trying to think about for myself is when you think about infrastructure, it is, you know, as you're suggesting around this notion of and an, an externality, it is something that essentially other people have done for you. It is, uh, you know, it is someone else who is, you know, set up something which you're now in, this conference for instance. What principles of organization would allow us to, to say that that is okay? So, I would like to reject that people science, which I think couldn't go anywhere. And I'd like to say, what, what principles would allow us to let other people do things for us? What, what would we need in place? I think one thing that would help would not start, to be not start from the point of view that they're not already doing things for ourselves, and even better, that there is this subject self uh, who then has to you know, make that leap to allow someone to do something for you. So I, this is a reason, again, that I referred to this, the notions of the shift and logisticality, that starting in a place where you don't imagine 
that you have some choice to now let someone do something for you, you know, seems a, a good start. Yes, I, I agree that that's the division that exists right now. And so what the question that I'm asking, because I, obviously we don't, I don't have a solution to this, is what, what forms of being together would allow us to, to transcend this notion that being together has to always reduce itself to a, a kind of impossible direct democracy, which among other things means an impossibility of infrastructure or an alienation of infrastructure from that moment. What kind of situations would allow us to put our hands in, ourselves in the hands of others? What kind of organizational situations, situations of social being would permit that? If I could answer that question, I think I would be addressing a kind of revolutionary infrastructure for ourselves. Uh, and that's the way that, and, and I, 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 I sense very much in what you're saying that, um, that the problem right now is that because, of course, in, in economics and business, sorry, just to finish this up, Ex externalization is a process. It's a constant process of, you know, ridding yourself of things that, you know, um, you know, <coughs> would ever give you the impression you're relying on anything other than your own, you know, wit, greed, and, and, and individualism, you know. Um, so, uh, in, in that sense, I think, you know, it, it's, a, it's our enemy all the time, and yet, um, we have to figure out some way in which uh, we could allow for, uh, yeah, as I say, for, for, for people to do something for us, to be in other people's hands, people we don't know uh, under organizational conditions that are constantly emerging and changing. And that, to me, would be a, a different form of infrastructure from, from the alienated one that we have right now. Uh, yeah, something about ornament, yeah, and because um, I, think, I think that's, that's fascinating, actually, and the notion of the, the Baroque. And, and the uh, the role of aesthetics, because the the because this issue might have a kind of a bearing on um, how we understand the way in which culture is not necessarily being uh, co-opted or it's internalized, but it's kind of become recombined with the economic process. So that the the DNA of a capitalist mode of production, right? is land, labor, capital, you know, technology. But the way in which um, the, uh, the forces of production are linked together is a social process. That's what we learned from Marx, right? The relations of production uh, are actually primary in order to unleash the technological forces of production. And if this seems uh, a kind of an exotic way of talking about it, then economic growth we're all familiar with because it's a kind of haunting, uh, lullaby that we're all consoled with, that this is what's basic, primary, and kind of important. But what's interesting, I think, about culture is the way in which culture now forms a kind of, um, um, the kind of style in which growth is articulated. It forms the outline, but it's not ornamental. It's the movement of the economy. I think that's how, uh, the, the way in which the economy is kind of performed the way in which um, economists and politicians are quite happy, not necessarily using the language of Deleuze and Guattari, but they will use an effective language, you know, about, and they will use a kind of a faux democratic language of subsidiarity. You know, it's about, it's about entrepreneurship and uh, innovation, actualization, growth. These are organic processes. You shouldn't look to the state. You shouldn't look for a structural solution. The problem is within you. And I think this is where I think the issue of culture, um, coming back to a point that somebody else made, it's not necessarily culture, it's the way in which culture provides a process of culturation and a way in which um, subjects are free to find their own position within this kind of logic and, 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 and develop a, a form of ornamentation, a form of production of their own lifestyle that can kind of regularize and give some kind of legitimacy for what is fundamentally Ill illegitimate. Thank you for your, your characterization of, of um, what you see as, as, um, as opposite dynamics. It really, it, it helps me clarify 
to my for myself that this is precisely what I don't want. That I, I precisely don't want infrastructure to operate as absolute externality and affect to operate as absolute internality. That the the sort of, of it, it seems to me that given that we have been infrastructuralized in all of our practices, and really I mean all of our practices, then it's absolute imperative for us to not accept that split, but to begin, begin to recognize, for example, what I think, I think consumer culture has recognized affective capital. But I think that what we haven't recognized is the, the potentials of affective drive. And so it's, it, it, it was very useful listening to you because I thought, yes, and if we don't get beyond that division, then we're really doomed. You know, then, then I suddenly sound like Franco Berardi. End game. No, not end game. But the, the absolute imperative urgency of not allowing those two to operate as binary opposites. I, I have the microphone, actually, <laughs> because I was waiting. Um, so this is for Sotor Kitana, she's <laughs> presenting tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I would like to link it a bit to tomorrow's talk, maybe, also. What do we think of uh, capital in uh, hidden and non-measurable forms, such as cultural capital, if we're talking about the art markets, uh, also to come back to relations that Louis also just mentioned, you know, uh, considering what Marx said, that what if... Um, relations create value and the only, uh, or social relations, the value is only created by interaction. And what Isabel Graf in her critique then um, claims is that in a connection as a network world that uh, artists kind of would never dare to critique each other um, because, you know, uh, the person you're critiquing today could be uh, the collaborator or the person you need in future. So in a way what I'm trying to say is one is that there are hidden and un non-measurable factors but also we are in fact creating the infrastructures as such ourselves uh, if we're cultural producers or artists or architects whatever and we perform and form the infrastructure. So my question probably for you would be how could I dare to criticize this infrastructure that I'm myself performing, but I'm also kind of uh, part of, that I'm depending on, question mark. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I, I, I really took that as uh, Irit's question. I, I took it as a proposition for um, for spaces, for institutions, um, to to create. Uh, I mean, in a sense, the aspiration is there to create impossible conditions, right? to hold on to impossible conditions, and to um, and within that, what what seems integral to your thinking of that is the idea that in order to uh, hold or carry, not even hold, but just carry uh, this impossibility uh, requires a certain um, uh, commitment to uh, sustained uh, failure and to inhabitation as a mode of uh, being uh, with others in, in spaces, uh, in kind of counter relations to spaces. I, but it, but not you know, not even going that far, but the, the sort of, of, really the principle of non-delivery, the, the sort of, of, of efforts that go in to a promise of non-delivery. So it seems to me this has a lot to do with what Stefano was talking about in terms of risk, this notion of value going up and going down that the, the sort of, of um, and it's interesting because it, it's, it's like a, 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 a sort of mirroring, you know, But it's also it's also sort of, of mirroring in terms of 
value can't be held, right? It, it, it moves from, from uh, surplus to, to lack, you know, kind of, 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 of constantly. And the, the sort of notion that you withdraw criticality in order to sustain a kind of stable playing field. Um, it, it's very it's very interesting to to think to think about that, but I'm wondering whether actually what's what's at hand is something we need to differentiate between, which is connectivity and infrastructure. I'm not sure that connectivity and infrastructure are the same thing. I think I think that um, with within the realm of, of connectivity, it's extremely difficult or dangerous or risky to, in some way, destabilize your position. But I think infrastructure has the ability of predetermining position. And I think those might not be the same dynamics. I'm not sure. I, I don't know if any, any of you have anything else to say about this. Um. I was always excited by uh, an idea that's in, um, it's not in postscript on control societies, which is about infrastructure. And that, yeah, it does. So, and that's one of the kind of, one of the basic texts, I think, which kind of generates this kind of interest in, um, in norms and regulations that don't have a kind of an ideological content, i.e. they're not received at the level of politics in a kind of, uh, kind of obvious and crude way, but they exist within a certain behavior and repetition of behaviors and kind of modulate difference. Um, but there's a line, it's not in that essay, but it's definitely in negotiations where he says, you know, I'm, I'm sick of communicating. I'm sick of, you know, having to state my prior position or my prior uh, claim uh, as an expert in order to state my expertise. And he says, what we've got nowadays is uh, too much communication. And this is you know, pre-internet. And he says, what we need are vacuoles of non-communication, circuit breakers, so we can elude control. And, and it seems, you know, it's 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 definitely not one of his most sophisticated formulations, but there is something quite powerful about the the notion that um, that links into I think somewhere where you're ending up with this this very interesting idea of an infrastructure of feeling, and I was quite moved when you were using and rearticulating Raymond Williams in this way, trying to trying to think social relations not as things which are always. Um, in the kind of log books or the algorithms of Price Waterhouse Coopers, but there is something primary before that, which isn't utopianism, but was but it was it is within the gift of an avant-garde which has yet to be kind of formed. Um, yeah, I'll just leave that. Um, yes, uh, I would like to ask uh, maybe for a more precise differentiation between the notion of infrastructure and notion of institution, uh, especially in the way it uh, used to be used in the art, uh, contemporary art discourse uh, in the last uh, at least three decades, and this uh, like really huge discourse of institutional critique, how it's developed uh, since late 60s, uh, till uh, new institutionalism, uh, I mean new institutionalism in, this, in, in the sense of this uh, curatorial trends. Uh, I, I think I don't have to go into details. Everybody's uh, well acquainted. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, the question also how much this uh, infrastructure, um, the discourse of infrastru infrastructure, how it's presented, it's uh, a little bit uh, um, seems to be a kind of rebranding of institutional critique uh, and just like trying to expand uh, certain conceptual frameworks. But at the same moment, uh, just it makes me also think uh, on uh, this, this big, uh, all long time became at uh, top of this idea of Gramsci without this cultural he he uh, hegemony and uh, actually infrastructures, institutions as a cultural uh, infrastructures which are like empty structures which can be filled uh, with any contents, with any intentions, uh, but they have the uh, logic. And uh, it w well, uh, one of the reasons why actually new in institutionalism uh, failed in practice uh, as, as fact, uh, because of this uh, 
uh, immanent logic of functioning uh, of this infrastructure. So um, that's uh, maybe um, more cl uh, clarification of uh, this conceptual shift and prop uh, also possible maybe like also surplus uh, value of uh, this uh, re mm, uh, given uh, 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 to di differentiate, uh, di trying to differentiate uh, infrastructure from institution uh, in, or institutional framework in a traditional uh, common sense. Well, I think others will have a lot to say about this as well, but I think the, the I, I don't think you can differentiate with them because institutions operate on the basis of infrastructures, some of which were, are autonomous to them and others are ways of connecting them to other institutions. So these are really you know, two, two different orders. I think what, what you bring up that I would want to think about is differentiating between institutional critique of, let's say, the 80s. 80s, 70s? I can't quite remember, 80s. Um, and between a kind of interrogation of the notion of infrastructure. I think institutional critique had to do with revealing the hidden ideological and vested interests of institutions that operated as kind of, of, of benign kind of facades. And um, so the, it, was, it, it was extremely important to, to in a way, um, kind of, of make evident the degree to which, let's say, um, notions of, of nationalism or notions of the market um, were absolutely paramount. You know, that, that institutions in a way were, were uh, the, the parade grounds you know, of, of this. I think, I think a discussion of infrastructure doesn't assume a hidden I think I think what it is what what is in what's really intriguing about it is strange unexpected conjunctions in terms of um, let's say you know like big cultural institutions in which fifteen absolutely contradictory elements are working together through the same enabling machine. I think what's intriguing about infrastructure is that it is seemingly disinterested in everything but the delivery mechanism of something that is determined pre-hand. So for me what's interesting to think about is what, what happens if the end result is not you know, what was presupposed to be delivery. And that's where the imperative of thinking um, the the um, the externality and the internality simultaneously, I think, because that's what brings in the unexpected conjunctions. So, I, to me, these are these are sort of two entirely different orders, and institutional critique, by definition, needs to have an an element of attending to infrastructure. But one of the problems with attending to infrastructure when you're doing institutional critique is that it gets you out of the institution. And most people who do institutional critique want to stay in the institution because you know that's what, what provides the moral fervor of that argument. It's extremely easy to rail against institutions, you know? Did you want to say more? No, no, no. I just like uh, wanted to say that uh, critique, in fact, became uh, like referring to this uh, famous uh, text by Foucault. What is a critique? Uh, critique, in fact, is a kind of enlightened uh, obedience. Yeah, if you just read it uh, carefully. Um, so, and uh, this use of, uh, or uh, all, uh, all the time, this reuse of uh, uh, issue of criticality and function of criticality is something which increases the efficiency of the system or of infrastructure and any respect. And uh, in, I mean, in this respect, I mean, this is quite uh, obvious uh, mode of thinking, but I mean, is it uh, also not possible to get rid out of it and talking about one of one of the things I, I wanted to add and forgot was that um, I, I, all of us here are people who have moved sideways 
So we probably had a discipline and a discourse and a set of, of agreed on values at some point. But we've all moved sideways. One of the wonderful things about institutions is that you can move sideways. You cannot move sideways within infrastructure, right? The, there's a, an element of agency that is simply not there, except in the ways in which one might be able to live out you know, affective and structural contradictions. So th that's really important for me to sort of say, to differentiate between institutions and infrastructure. Sorry, you were going to say something. Um, yeah, I was going to, um, I was just going to say that I, I have a fairly um, unsophisticated idea of infrastructure. I mean, it seems like it's something that, um, allows us to do more than we otherwise could do on our own. And it seems that the problem with infrastructure is that it, it, it doesn't deliver on that. And that rather than our continuing to have some kind of ability to push forward what we're trying to do with infrastructure, infrastructure has its own ideas. It's, it's une unequally available to people. It, it shifts and moves in, in certain ways that tend to structure and control it. And in that sense, I think it is connected to institutional critique. And you know, if you think about like uh, the work that Arundhati Roy was involved with the dams in India or something, you know, the point about the infrastructure is it doesn't do what it says it's going to do. You know, it's supposed to deliver all this water to people and ends up, you know, in the swimming pools in Mumbai or something, right? So we, we have at that basic level the fact that infrastructure doesn't actually work for us for all the reasons that it's been, we've, I've been trying to talk about it. it's financialization, it's, the, it's, it's conditioned as private property, et cetera, et cetera. What seems to happen at that moment is that we, we often make this sort of critique where it's, you know, it somehow has to do with this inevitable and alienation, you know, what Sartre would call the kind of practical inert. You know, oh, of course, of course it's not working for us because it's over there and it's this, this objective thing that's away from us. And what I would like to do and may, is to try to break away from that notion of, of the object subject in that particular kind of way and, it's, and, and, and not think that it's inevitable that infrastructure should stand against us. Um, and yet at the same time, not because uh, I'm intimate with it all the time, I, I understand it or I'm doing it. I, I still want it done to me in a certain way. I mean, I, I don't plan to run the water fact, the water plant, right? Or, or I, don't, I don't care how the lights come in the room, you know? I, I want those things to happen and I don't think that because they happen wrong now that, that, that it's a bad thing that you know, there are people who do that kind of thing for me and I do something for someone else. This is the point I was trying to raise about debt. You know, one of the reasons we think it's a bad thing is that somehow that, that doesn't clear. You know, well, if it cleared and we, we all got what we paid for, et cetera, then it would be fine, right? That seems to me not the, the problem here. The problem is here how we would enter into relations where our ability to do something was in other people's hands. Um, rather than imagining that the problem is it's not in my hands or inevitably if it's in someone else's hands, it's, you know, it's going to go bad, etc. That's just what I wanted to add in there. I, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, you might even give him the last word. Okay. <laughs> no, it, it's not the last word, it's more a question. Um, <coughs> when I listened to you in your uh, presentation, what did not become clear to me is do you use infrastructure in a descriptive way? So we have infrastructures, and now our question is how to use them according to our intentions? Or do you use the term infrastructure in a way, in a prescriptive way, that uh, we have to let us think what kind of infrastructures we have to create in order to be functional to us. Uh, this became not clear to me. So is infrastructure a new project? Uh, so we have to develop this concept in pra new practices? Or is infrastructure already there? And you, it's, it's a kind of formal description of a situation, social situation. And the only question is how to deal with it? Or is it? in itself a project. 
<laughs> I don't. I, should. I mean, um, I'm surprised that it's, uh, I'm sorry that it's unclear to you because I thought at this point it was pretty clear I was just talking about communism. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, Lenin says communism is the Soviets plus electrification, right? Plus electrification. So in that small formulation, he's already talking about infrastructure as not the Soviet in a certain sense. So it's already, it's already an idea of having part of yourself in somebody else's hands in that moment, right? Um, this is what I want to try to think. Obviously not in the same way that it was thought that way because you know, that's, we didn't get it thought through completely there. So we have more work to do. But I don't want to abandon the idea that it is a Soviet plus electrification. I want to figure out why, why we aren't able to realize that. Uh, so if at least I can leave the room having been totally obvious, uh, Reed will have to. Uh, <laughs> Struggle. I, I think for me it's neither prescriptive nor descriptive. I think it's a recognition that um, there are that we are enveloped in a series of protocols that produce conjunctions that whose aim is delivery. I think that one one of the things that and I don't think there's a way out, right? I, I don't think there's a world without infrastructure. But I think that there is um there's there's a need to complicate infrastructure to introduce criticality into it um, to produce much higher levels of consciousness of living it out. I, I don't think one can infuse infrastructure with agency. I think it's it's precisely the propaganda of infrastructure that it has agency. And I think it doesn't have agency. I, I, I think that's, to me, that's a false path to, to, to sort of, of, of um, to go down. So I think that, that, um, I, I started nodding and then you, you ended the sentence differently. Okay, so how should I have ended up the sentence? Tell me. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say that it was, it was there to give us, it pretends to give us agency. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and it doesn't. It doesn't. And it I, doesn't. No. But I think to, to try and infuse it with agency is to not understand it properly. Right? It's it's to understand it um, in a way, because I I think that the problem for people like us to be talking about infrastructure is the problem of endlessly self-proliferating structures that. Um, have a great deal of unexamined promise at their heart. Um, and, and, and you know, I, I completely agree with you, Stefano, about the, the sort of not working. But I was in Jamaica, and all the time I was there, the lights were flickering. And I said, you know, what's going on here? And they said, Enron. <laughs> we sold Jamaican energy to Enron, and since then the lights have been flickering. And when we sort of talked about it, it was dual. It was on the one hand an absolute act of treason to have sold you know, the national energy resource to Enron. And on the other hand, it was an absolute promise of having entered modern Western infrastructure. And the, the, both of these coexisted. And so the pull, the lure of infrastructure is precisely, you know, it doesn't work and it produces a kind of affective aspirational lure that is strong enough to actually pull people in. So I think that, that um, I, I, I don't assume an outside, but I do assume a kind of possibility of inhabiting it in a much more critical and much more attenuated way and making the internal contradictions very productive for us. Um, the, the, there isn't, and, and there I think we really part ways. I don't think that there is the, an inevitable conclusion you know, to a kind of infrastructural condition. I think that that I'm I'm saying.
gone over by about 20 minutes. Five more minutes? Five more minutes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Want to say something about it? It is microphone. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see. I have yeah. a Twitter question. Yeah. And when has a Twitter question? <laughs> yes. I'm dying to know what the Twitter question is. Go on. So the Twitter question, <laughs> courtesy of Jennifer Hope Davy, is um, she says infrastructure neutralizes criticality, obviously. So how does acculturation determine infrastructure and or the other way around? So obviously they're not isolated, but they're intertwined. So how, how do they mutually influence each other? I think we, in a way we've just answered. I, but I wanted to ask the Twitter question. <laughs> <laughs> First the answer and then the question. Yeah, which is a yeah. part of the infrastructure. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so this kind of relates to the last bit of your discussion, and um, it seems as though your uh, discussion about subjectivity constituted through infrastructure relies on um, uh, a kind of humanist distinction between subject and object, but the um, shift that we might have seen in art uh, in, in recent years or the location of art from um, production to circulation, perhaps, that's how I see it, and, um, uh, has produced artworks that actually produce infrastructure. And the, you know, giant and obvious example is efflux, um, or for example, uh, dis images, which is um, a, a stock image service as artwork. Um, and there are uh, many other examples, increasingly more so, of artworks that are simultaneously the artwork, the artist, the platform for art or its circulation and its infrastructure. So how do you understand, I mean, are you interested in the horizon of art um, not necessarily as one of negotiating infrastructure but producing it? My, my response to that though is that that sounds like the, the artists are becoming more like corporate entities. <laughs> Um, and are identifying more with the same type of strategic processes that would go into forming a type of production process or service process that formulates a um, you know, basic unit, which is a firm. So that the notion of a firm, of a corporate institution, is something which is uh, maybe play, played with within the art world, but... Um, there might be a migration of that kind of set of institutional processes into a, a new arena. Yeah, and to me the distinction you make is just, um, you know, it's, it's a very old notion um, of artistic practices that just have different paths of dissemination and I, I don't see any movement in that. I think you know, wh where I hang out, um, I think what happens is a recognition that we have complex and absolutely different processes of knowledge production. And knowledge production does not, that these knowledges don't disseminate in the same way that the old knowledges do, and that their effect in the world is not their um, expanded circulation. And so I, I think that, um, and I think these processes of knowledge production sometimes mimic, sometimes institute, sometimes um, inhabit in hugely kind of conscious ways. I don't think they necessarily produce, I, I, the, the productionist model you know, of creative practice is something you know, that's very distant from me. And so I, I think that I just wouldn't take up, you know, these terms, you know, that what's happened is kind of mass circulation of stuff that gets produced. Because I think where we are now is not in the production of stuff. I mean, sure, the market is in the production of stuff, but um, that is a, it's a kind of, you know, machinic mainstream that uh, goes on and on and on. But, you know, 
in the, co in the conversations that are conjunctions between different ways of knowing the world, that's not what's happening. So no. Hello. Yes, I have a question. Uh, and I was part of the barbarian outside. <laughs> and I had a question. I wasn't even sure I'd be able to phrase it as a question. So I've been trying desperately to compress it into a very pithy, you know, because there's all this time pressure. Uh, it's really directed at Stefano, but if there's a relation with what uh, Irit, I believe, was saying in relation to her experience in Jamaica. And Stefano uh, <clears throat> began with um, a kind of core moment or core, a core kind of uh, connection that I found really, really interesting, which is that essentially racism is the ideology of logistics. <coughs> or let's just say anthropological difference. The institution of anthropological difference is the ideology of logistics. And then we've gone through an historical turn in which that's been completely reversed in which logistics is going to be now the realization of the maintenance of anthropological difference or the, or, or the uh, 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 raison d'etre for racism, right? So the problem with infrastructure for me, <coughs> using this terminology, is of course the problematic difference between what Jacques Bidet describes as the difference between system and structure. Structure is always relating to a state of class and system is actually the competition at a global level among peoples who have to form themselves on a racial anthropological model as states, nations. States, nations. I don't want to use the term nation state because it's not as clear as states, nations. Right? So what's missing isn't so much the oppositions that's being brought out between or the complicity between affect and infrastructure because there's an oscillation between that and that's actually one of the things that Stefano is trying to say is the place where in the cultural sphere the um, uh, management of risk is coming in is invading right in this place, but actually what we need to do is to problematize not that opposition, right, but know the opposition between structure and system in a totally different way and to break apart that anthropological apparatus. Well, I don't know if I was saying it uh, that well, <laughs> but I agree with it and I think that one of the real dangers of the spread of logistics is what Patricia Clough calls population racism. The possibility to, to begin a, a period of sorting bodies based on, on racial characteristics that don't even make an attempt to, to codify uh, th that into, into, into subjects, into, into peoples, etc. And, uh, and in that sense, this is why I was tr I've tried to finish when I was talking more formally about logistics being dangerous in a number of ways. I think it's very dangerous for logistics to wade into this territory in which it's no longer dealing with subjects. But it's also very dangerous for, for the bodies that it's encountering, <laughs> sorting, and, and trying to put into motion in the ways that it does. So, um, so I think you're absolutely right. I, you know, I think... I think uh, we're in for all kinds of uh, anthropology. I want, I want to sort of, of I, want, I want to say something incredibly simple and simple-minded. Last word. Last word? Okay. Well, the last word is going to be very simple-minded. I think that one of the one of the lures of infrastructure is that within it, bits of expertise, bits of capacity, bits of technology um, kind of, of come into contact with one another entirely unframed from the way they came into the world. And that the potential of infrastructure is precisely the connection between a whole set of unframed things. Now, they're unframed and utilized in order to deliver something, you know, whatever the ultimate promise. But it's their internal life in relation to one another that is what I think is interesting about infrastructure because they're not operating there in the name of this expertise or that expertise. You know, it's only in their conjunction that they can promise 
to deliver whatever it is that they're promising to deliver. And the, the importance of it is not the outcome, but the lived relations between bits of things that no longer identify with whatever framed them coming into the world. And I think that that, for me, is, is kind of what, what becomes really interesting about infrastructure. And that's where it's, it's kind of, it's a very contemporary set of processes. And I'm inter and that's why I think it's it's a mode of contemporaneity. Okay, so that's my simple-minded sort of, of coda. So tomorrow afternoon we continue with presentations by Adrian and by Luis, by Fusun Turgutan and Kirken Ergun, um, and another briefer discussion than today. Thank you so much for your participation. <laughs>